Okay, let us begin today's uh, discussion about chemistry. So everybody gets settled in, who's walking in, and let's wrap up the, uh, the socializing for now. All right, so we're going to continue on talking about orbitals today. Uh, last time we, we started introducing the quantum mechanical model for electronic structure. And you know, some of the key ideas there are that we cannot simultaneously know the, the position and the energy of an electron. There's a lot of uncertainty that's, that's governed by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So because of that, there's this new model that developed called quantum mechanical model, and um, it revolves around the Schrodinger equation. And then the Schrodinger equation, the solutions to that are what we call wave functions, and those are synonymous with orbitals. So these orbitals are mathematical functions, and the mathematical functions have three parameters that we've learned so far, which we call quantum numbers, and those quantum numbers tell us something about the size, energy, and shape of the orbital, and so today we're going to start putting that into a more physical description and talking about the shapes of the orbitals and then talking about the factors that influence which orbitals are higher and lower in energy than others. So we ended last time by talking about the shapes of S orbitals, which are the simplest ones. Those just have spherical shapes. Remember that these shapes that we're drawing, they represent the region in space where the electron is most likely to be found if it's in that orbital. So traditionally we do this as a 90% probability region. So it's, as a, you know, the quantum mechanical model tells us, we can't exactly know where the electron is, but it's somewhere in that region of space most of the time, and that's what the shape of the orbital is that we're going to be talking about and drawing today. All right, so let's move on to p orbitals. We'll do it for 2p orbitals specifically. So for 2p orbitals, n equals 2, l equals 1. Those are the first two quantum numbers. So whenever we have a p orbital, that tells us that l equals 1. And then because we have l equals 1, we have three possible m sub l values. We have minus 1, 0, and plus 1, which means if we're going to draw the shapes of the 2p orbitals, we have three of them that we have to consider with the three different m sub l values. So the first thing we can talk about, just like we did for s orbitals, is the radial probability density. So because n equals 2 and l equals 1, the number of radial nodes, remember, is n minus l minus 1. So in this case, we have zero radial nodes. So the radial probability distribution for a 2p orbital is going to look qualitatively similar to a 1s orbital, just a single peak with the most probable radius here. Now, if I was drawing this quantitatively, this most probable radius for a 2p orbital would be different than what you get for a 1s orbital because n equals 2, so on average it's going to be farther away from the nucleus. But the basic shape is the same. You have no radial nodes. You have some area that's the most uh, probable radius. But the, what's different about the p orbitals is going to be their angular function or their overall shape um, when we draw them out in the Cartesian coordinates. So remember that the number of angular nodes is just given by L. So all of these 2p orbitals are going to have one nodal plane, and that's going to define the shape of the orbitals. So because we have a nodal plane that goes right through the center, all of these are going to have sort of what I would call a, a dumbbell shape. And the only difference between the three 2p orbitals is their orientation in space. So we're going to have one that's along the x-axis, which we call px. So you have a sort of a two-lobed orbital that goes along the x-axis. Now one thing that your book doesn't do, which I kind of wish they did, is they don't show the phasing of the orbital. So what, what I mean by phasing is that even though this probability distribution um, is, is given by the square of the wave function, in reality the wave function itself can have both positive and negative regions. It's a mathematical function. So whenever you have a nodal plane that cuts an orbital in half, as you cross that nodal plane, you have to change the phase of the orbital. And so this is important for um, things we'll talk about later in the course, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce it now. Very often you'll see p orbitals drawn with one of the lobes shaded into some color. And all that tells you is that the phase of the wave function changes as you cross the nodal plane. So it's arbitrary how we consider it, but this, for example, would be the positive lobe or the negative lobe or vice versa, however you want to think about it, it's arbitrary. But it, the, the, the point is that the phase of the two sides are different. So when you have these p orbitals, the nodal plane is defined by the other two Cartesian axes. So if we have a px orbital that's along the x-axis, then yz is the nodal plane. So remember from geometry, each, each set of two axes defines a plane. So if we define the yz plane, that would, that's going to be the nodal plane. That's the one that cuts this orbital in half. 
Okay? And then the other p orbitals are exactly the same, they're just oriented differently in space. So we have a py orbital, which is going to be along the y-axis. So exact same shape, but just rotated 90 degrees. All right, remember that the m sub l value, which is with it, these are all going to have different m sub l values, that tells you the orientation. Although there's not a direct correlation between these three values of m sub l and x, y, and z. It depends on how you parameterize the function. So there's, it's not to say that this is minus 1, this is 0, and this is plus 1. But when we have three different m sub l values, we have to have three different orientations. And so they're going to be along the, the three axes here. So the PI, py orbital has an x, z nodal plane. And then the last one, of course, is PZ, which has an XY nodal plane. So the nodal plane is going to be the plane that's per perpendicular to the direction of the orbital and cuts it in half. All right, now obviously Blackboard is not the, the best platform for asking you to draw things. So you're not going to have to draw these yourselves on a test or a homework assignment, but you should be able to recognize them. If we give you a picture of the orbital, and we specify its orientation, you should be able to identify it as an S, a P, or a D orbital, and which one it is. And we'll get to the D orbitals here in a second. So that's kind of the level that we want you to understand these shapes at, is just being able to, to recognize them and to know some things about the nodal planes and all that stuff. Now, I'm not going to draw any higher P orbitals, so we can also have 3P, 4P, 5P orbitals. Those would look pretty much the same, it's just they would have some radial nodes. So if you look at the radial distribution function, 3P would have one radial node, 4P would have two, and so on. But the same basic shapes would, would, would arise. You'd have these sort of dumbbell-shaped orbitals where there'd be some value of the radius where the electron can't exist, but the overall shape of the electron density is still the same. Okay, so those are the P orbitals. So let's move on to the last one that we're responsible for, which is D orbitals. These are the ones that have the most complicated shapes that you'll be need to be familiar with. Um, and they're also the hardest to draw, so this will test my limited art artistic talent, which is, well, not much at all. Um, all right, so for 3D orbitals is what we're going to start with. Um, we have n equals 3, l equals 2. And so again, if we have these different quantum numbers here for 3D orbitals, we're going to have zero radial nodes. n minus l minus 1 is 0. So the radial distribution function will look just kind of like it did before some peak at some radius, but no nodes. So, but then the, the part that's going to define the shape is the number of nodal planes. And because L equals 2, we now have two nodal planes. So two planes that are going to bisect the orbital and where the phase is going to change on either side of those planes. All right, and because we have two nodal planes, most of the d orbitals are going to have uh, sort of a, a four-leaf clover shape. All right, so there's four d orbitals that are going to have the exact same shape, just different orientations, and then one that's sort of the oddball. Okay, so the the one that we we can draw a few of these. So there's d x y. So three of the d orbitals are just oriented in the three different Cartesian planes x y x z and y z, and they're given those names. All right, so if we have the d x y orbital, then it's going to be along the xy axis. I'm going to highlight those to make my drawing a little bit more clear. So that's the plane that this orbital is oriented in. Now, there, are, there is some three-dimensional structure, but this is sort of the, the basic orientation of the orbital. So it's going to have a lobe that goes between the x and y axes in each quadrant. And then you have alternating positive and negative phases as you go around this orbital. So it's kind of a four-leaf clover. This one's sitting perpendicular to the board, so it's a little bit hard to see, but one of them will be a little bit more clear. All right, we also have um, dxz. So in the dxz orbital, it's going to be along the x and z axes. The lobes are going to be in between those axes. So it's the exact same shape, but just rotated into a different orientation, 90 degrees. And then one, oops, one that looks exactly the same as that is going to be the dyz, which is going to be along the y and z axes. All right. So again, for these three orbitals, the lobes go in between the respective axes that define the orbital. 
All right, so these are just four-leaf clover shapes that have three different orientations. One would be like this, this, and this, for example, depending on how you orient the coordinates. But they're all just mutually perpendicular to each other, and the lobes go in between the axes. Now, there's another one that also has this four-leaf clover shape, and this one is called dx squared minus y squared. And this one is just what has the lobes exactly along the x and y axes. So it's going to have a lobe along x in each direction and a lobe along y. And again, alternating positive and negative lobes because of the two nodal planes. All right, so basically, x, y, and x squared minus y squared are exactly the same but rotated 45 degrees now in the same plane. Okay, so four orbitals that have the exact same shape but just a different orientation. And then the one that's the oddball is called the dz squared orbital. All right, so the name does tell us something about its orientation. It's, it's mostly along the z-axis. But instead of having a four-leaf clover shape, it has sort of this dumbbell shape where the two lobes are the same phase, and then we have a torus of opposite phase that's going around it. So it's almost like a, d a dumbbell with a donut around it, if you want to think about it that way. Okay, so this one doesn't actually have two nodal planes. It has two nodal cones. So you have a, you'd have a cone that goes out in both the positive and negative z directions, that's going to be the node for that orbital. It's a little bit hard to picture. But it's a slightly different shape, but it still has the, the two uh, angular nodes like we would have for any d orbital. Okay, so these are the five d orbitals. Because L equals two, I guess I should have pointed this out event at the beginning. M sub L is minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. So we have five different M sub L values, which is why we have five different d orbitals with five different orientations. Okay, so all four of them are the same, just oriented differently in space. One of them is a little bit different. So like I said, your, your, you know, your job is going to have to be to just look at a picture of an orbital and identify which one it is in a sort of a multiple choice setting. So that's kind of the level of depth you should really know these things at. We're not going to do F orbitals because uh, you would probably need an advanced degree in art to be able to draw the F orbitals. Um, they have a lot of lobes. So I'm not even going to attempt to do those. You're not going to be responsible for those. Now the other thing I've done here, because um, I'm not very good at drawing, is I reproduced from, I don't know if this is your textbook or the previous textbook we used to use, but pictures of d orbitals, which maybe more clearly show the orientations and things that, that I was trying to get at in the last slide. Um, so these are some additional pictures of the d orbital, same exact thing I drew before. These ones are not showing the phasing though. So as I said, your book and the previous book that I used in this course don't show the different phases of the, of the lobes, which is a little bit irritating because Later on, when we start talking about bonding, those are going to be important. Okay, so that's the, the shapes of the orbitals. So let's just do a couple example problems about orbitals before we move on from this topic. All right, so the, this problem, we'll, we'll, get, you know, we'll see problems like this in the homework most likely. Which of the following orbital designations is incorrect? All right, so we're giving you a set of two quantum numbers and then identifying what kind of orbital that refers to, and we want to know which one of those is wrong. Okay, so there's a couple things we should check here when we're doing these problems. The first thing is we're giving you the value of L, and we're matching it up with in one of these letter designations, S, P, D, or F. So let's make sure that those check out. So remember that when we have S, P, D, and F, this corresponds to the L values 0, 1, two and three. So we should look at all these quickly. The first one, A, L equals zero is an S orbital, that's okay. L equals one is a P orbital. L equals two is a D orbital. L equals three is an F orbital. So that part of it, nothing wrong with it. So the SPDF part seems to be correct based on the values of L that I've given you. But then the other thing we have to check is, are these actually valid pairs of N and L values? Because remember that the allowed values of L depend on the value of N. We can't just have any random combination of N and L. So if we have N equals two, the allowed values of L are going to be zero and one. So N can be any positive integer value. So N equals two, three, four, three, those are all fine. But then the allowed values of L are gonna be zero and one. This one has an L equals zero, so that's fine. If we go to the second one, N equals three, which means L can be either 0, 1, or 2. And this one is an L equals 1, 3p orbital, so that works out. 
n equals 4, l equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. And this one has given us L equals 2, so we're okay for C. But if we look at choice D, this is where the problem results. N equals 3, L is going to be either 0, 1, or 2, as we saw above. And this one is an L equals 3, 3F three orbital. So that type of orbital won't exist. You cannot have L equals 3 when N equals 3. Okay, so this is a problem. We can't have those two paired up. So choice D is going to be the one that is incorrect. Okay, so you won't have three f orbitals. The first shell where you'll have f orbitals is the fourth shell. You'll have four f orbitals, but you're never going to have three f, two f, or one f orbitals. Okay, so we have to remember that there's that dependence where the values of L that are allowed are determined by the value of N, which shell you're in. All right, so that's where what that problem gets out, uh, a bit of a review from last time. And then this one is just asking us to name the orbital pictured at the right. So when you're, when you're choosing names of orbitals, we should first identify whether it's an S, a P, or a D. That's sort of the first thing to look at, and that's given by the basic shape. So an S orbital is going to be a sphere. This is clearly not a sphere. A P orbital should only have two lobes and be dumbbell shaped, so it's not a P orbital. And then remember the D orbitals, most of them have this four-leaf clover shape. So this is definitely a D orbital, so we can remove choice A. And then which of these D orbitals is it? So remember that the name of the d orbital sort of tells us the orientation. So this one is along the xy plane, and the one where the lobes are directly along the x and y axis is going to be dx squared minus y squared. All right. So if you know, we could give you different drawings, different orientations, but as long as the axes are labeled, you should be able to identify all of these. So dx squared minus y squared has the lobes along the x and the y axes, but they're directly on the axes in this case. Dxy would have the lobes in between each set of axes. All right, so definitely review those shapes that we went over today um, and, and started the last time. Okay, any questions on that before I move on? All right, so that's kind of the, the story about the shapes of the orbitals. And now we're going to start talking about how we put electrons into orbitals, because as we've been sort of referring to, these orbitals are regions in space where electrons can exist. So if we have an atom that has more than one electron, which orbitals are those electrons going to go into? So the first thing we need to understand before we start doing this is that there is a fourth quantum number for the electron. So the first three quantum numbers, n, l, and m sub l, are going to define the orbital, but then there's a fourth quantum number that's specific to the electron itself. So this fourth quantum number is called the spin quantum number. And it only has two possible values. It's abbreviated m sub s. So we have m sub l and m sub s are the last two quantum numbers. So m sub s is either going to be plus one half or minus one half. And very often in, in common chemistry language, you will hear these referred to as spin up or spin down. So if it's m sub s is plus one half, we say it's a spin up electron. If m sub s is minus one half, we say that's a spin down electron. All right, so only two possible values for m sub s, plus one half, minus one half. It's the only one that doesn't have integer values, as it turns out, but there's only two possibilities, so not too difficult. Now, what exactly does this one mean? So the first three quantum numbers are, the, are, as I said, are the property of the orbital that the electron is sitting in. This fourth quantum number is a property of the electron itself. And so electrons, um, for, for reasons that are very quantum mechanical nature, have magnetic fields associated with them. And so this m sub s value tells you the direction of the electron's magnetic field. So it's the inherent magnetic field of the electron itself. And it's either going to be pointing up or pointing down, basically. All right, but the key point is that this is a property of an individual electron. It has nothing to do with the orbital that the electron is in. All right, so that means now we have a total of four quantum numbers. N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. And what we're working towards is that every single electron in a multi-electron atom, right, or any atom really, is going to have a set of four quantum numbers associated with it. And as we'll see, it's going to be a unique set of four quantum numbers. So we're, we can assign each electron in the atom as having a set of four quantum numbers, n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. The first three are going to tell us which specific orbital the electron is. 
And then this last one that we just introduced is going to be a property of that electron itself uh, in that orbital. Okay? So we're going to be, that's what we're going to be working towards uh, as, we, as we move forward today. So to understand how we put electrons into orbitals, we have another rule to define, which is called the Pauli exclusion principle. So there are, there are three rules that we're going to introduce that have to deal with how we arrange electrons into orbitals. And the first one is, is and perhaps the most important one, is the Pauli exclusion principle. So this guy doesn't look particularly happy either, but uh, his insight was very profound and very important, which is that no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of quantum numbers. All right, so as I said, each, each electron is going to have a set of four quantum numbers associated with it. And each electron in a single atom is going to have a unique set of four quantum numbers that's different from every other electron in that atom. So no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of quantum numbers or have the same four quantum numbers. All right, so let's talk about what this then tells us about when we're going to be starting to put electrons into orbitals. So, as I said, this fourth quantum number here is, has only two possible values. So, the first three quantum numbers tell you what orbital electron is. The fourth quantum number can either be plus one half or minus one half. So, what this tells us then is that there's a maximum of two electrons per orbital. So when we're filling orbitals with electrons, we can put no more than two electrons into a single orbital. And this is, and we're going to talk mostly about the ground state of atoms, which is the lowest energy state. So in the lowest energy, you never have more than two electrons per orbital in any situation. But when you when you're forming the ground state for an atom, you're going to have either zero, one, or two electrons per orbital. You're never going to have more than two. Okay. And the other implication of this is that when an orbital has two electrons, so let's, let's talk about the case where we completely fill an orbital with two electrons. The spins are what we call paired. I don't know why they use the word paired to describe this. It's kind of a little bit confusing, but it means they have to be opposite. So when you have two electrons in an orbital, they have to have different quantum numbers. They can't have the same four quantum numbers. So that means when you have two in an orbital, one has to be plus one half for m sub s. And then the second has to be minus one half. It doesn't, as we'll see, it doesn't really matter whether you put the first electron in spin up or the first electron in spin down. By convention, when we're filling orbitals, we always put the first electron in spin up and then the second electron spin down. But from an energetic standpoint, it doesn't matter. All right, but that's, that's what the Pauli exclusion principle is, and that's the implications of it, is that we can have no more than two electrons per orbital, and when we do, they have to have opposite spins. So now let's talk about, we, we know that there's only two electrons per orbital, so then how, do we, how many electrons are there total or possible in a given shell or subshell? So if we have a given shell number, a given value of n, how many total electrons can we have in the atom that have that value of n? So one relationship that we saw last week, or maybe it was earlier this week, I'm losing track of the days already, but um, we saw that the maximum number of orbitals in a shell is given by n squared. Whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself, just n squared. So there's n squared orbitals in a given shell. There's two electrons per orbital, so people got mad at me for how I wrote that. You just want to change this. There we go. Two electrons per orbital, which means if we have a given shell number, the, the maximum number of electrons is equal to two n squared. Keep in mind this is the maximum number. This doesn't mean that if you have an n equals two shell, for example, it has to have exactly eight electrons in it, but that's the most number of electrons you can put into that shell, is 2n squared, whatever the value of n is. All right, that's the maximum number of electrons. And if we're talking about a subshell, we saw that for a subshell, the number of orbitals only depends on the value of L. So 
the number of orbitals is 2L plus 1. So that means the number of electrons is just going to be twice that because we can put two electrons per orbital. 2 times 2L plus 1. We're going to simplify that 4L plus 2. Okay? So if we're talking about a specific subshell, the number of electrons that can go in that subshell only depends on the, the value of L. All right, so let's cut, look at a couple of examples of, of how this works. And again, these relationships are a big time saver for you. So you could always you know, go through and write out all the possible quantum numbers for a given shell or subshell and figure out you know, how many electrons can go in there. But by knowing these simple relationships, it'll save you a lot of time when you're asked to do that. So you don't have to write out each individual set of quantum numbers. All right, so if we look at some examples, if we have for the, the third shell, which is the n equals 3 shell. The number of electrons maximum is going to be 2n squared, which is 2 times 3 squared, or 18. So for the n equals 3 shell, we can have a maximum of 18 electrons in there. And now we can also, using the second relationship, figure out, well, how are these electrons divided up into the different subshells? So when n equals 3, you're going to have three different subshells. 3s is the first one. And so the number of electrons that go into the 3s subshell, or the maximum number, is going to be 2 times 2l plus 1. So l is 0 for the s subshell. So only two electrons can go into the 3s subshell. If we go to the 3p subshell, L equals 1, so now we have this relationship, and that's going to give us a total of 6 electrons that can go into the 3p subshell. And then for the 3d, which is the last subshell in the, in the third shell, L equals 2. So we can put 10 electrons into the 3d subshell. So the maximum 18 electrons that go into the third shell, a total of two of them can go into 3s, six of them can go into 3p, and ten of them can go into 3d. So that's how they divide up into the different subshells within the third shell. All right, and again, for a subshell, the maximum number of electrons only depends on L. So if we were talking about a 4s subshell instead of a 3s subshell, there'd still only be a maximum of two electrons in there. If we were talking about a 4p instead of a 3p, there'd still be only a maximum of four electrons in that subshell even though the shell is going to have maybe different numbers of electrons as you go from the different values of n. Okay, so those are some relationships very closely related to things we've already talked about. And then the next thing we need to determine are the factors that determine the energy of the electron when it's in an orbital. So as I mentioned, what we're working towards is defining the quantum numbers or the orbital arrangements for all of the electrons in a ground state atom. So we want the energy levels to be as low as possible so basically what we're going to be end up doing is filling the lowest energy orbitals first and then the, the next available and so on and so on, just working our way up. So we need to understand what factors influence the energy of an electron when it sits in an orbital. So there are two factors that we have to consider now that we're talking about multi-electron atoms. So when we had the one electron case, which was pretty well described by the Bohr model um, in some sense, the only interaction we had to worry about was the interaction of the electron with the, the protons in the nucleus. So that's still going to be present when you have multi-electrons. You have protons in the nucleus, you have electrons that are around that nucleus in the different orbitals, and so there's going to be an attraction between them because they're oppositely charged. So as we add protons to the nucleus, we get a stronger attraction, so the, the strength of attraction between the protons and the electrons depends on how many of them there are. And that's going to give us a lower or more negative energy value. Okay, So as we add more protons to the nucleus, we're going to decrease the energy of the electron uh, that's, that's in the given subshell because there's more protons that's attracted to. And this relates directly to the Bohr equation, which we, we only, this only applies for one electron systems, but the same idea is still true for multi-electron systems. So the Bohr equation had that z squared dependence on the energy, that dependence on the atomic number, 
And for multi electron atoms, we have the same thing. As we add more protons to the nucleus, we are going to have a stronger attraction. We are going to decrease the energy of a given orbital. But when you have multi electron atoms, you have a second interaction you have to worry about, which is electron electron repulsion. Okay, so if we only have one electron, this isn't an issue, but in multi electron atoms, the electrons experience repulsive interactions with other electrons. And these repulsive interactions are destabilizing, which means they raise the energy of the system. All right, so whenever you're adding electrons to a multi-electron atom and trying to arrange them into the lowest possible energy configuration, you have two competing effects. The electrons want to get as close as they can to the nucleus to be attracted to the nucleus and experience that stabilizing, attractive interaction, but then they also want to be as far away from the other electrons as possible so that they have less of this destabilizing interaction that's going to raise the energy of, of the electrons in that given orbital. So then that's sort of the idea of, of how we want to arrange, those are sort of the qualitative ideas, so let's see how it works in real orbitals. So there's there's two effects that's going to in influence the energy of an orbital in a multi-electron system, and these are called shielding and penetration. Okay? So shielding is going to reduce the nuclear charge that is experienced by an electron. This is somewhat related to electron-electron repulsion. And so when we have a multi-electron atom, we're going to have some electrons that are closer to the nucleus, some that are farther away with different values of n. And those inner electrons, the ones that have the smaller n values, are going to block the outer electrons from experiencing some of the nuclear charge. Okay, so you have this effect called shielding in multi-electron systems that's going to influence the energy of an orbital as well because, as I mentioned, the electrons want to experience as much of that attractive interaction with the nucleus as possible. But let's say you have, uh, let's say you have six protons in the nucleus and you have two electrons that are really close to that nucleus. Those two electrons are going to block the other four electrons from feeling the full nuclear charge. And as an approximation, you could say that the outer electrons only really see or, or experience four protons of those six in the nucleus because two of them are blocked by the inner electrons. So there's some dilution of the nuclear charge as you go farther away from the nucleus because the electrons that are closer to the nucleus are blocking some of that positive charge or canceling it out if you want to think about it that way. And so that's what we call the effective nuclear charge. It's the charge that's actually felt by an electron and it's going to be less than the full nuclear charge for the outer electrons. And so what, what this, so that Z EFF is Z effective, the effective nuclear charge. And so what this tells us is that um, the lower energy orbitals, the ones that we're going to fill first, tend to have smaller n values. So the, the n value tells you how close the electron is to the nucleus. So the smaller n values are closer to the nucleus. They have less shielding from the inner electrons, and those are going to be the ones that we fill first. Okay, so when we're filling electrons into orbitals, we fill the lowest value of n first. But let's say we have the same value of n in two va different values of L. For a one electron atom, it doesn't matter. So let's talk about, for example, the difference between 2s and 2p. So for filling electrons into the same shell with two different subshells of 2s and 2p, which one gets filled first in this case? 
So for one electron system, it doesn't matter. The value of L doesn't determine anything about the energy. But for multi-electron systems, there is also an effect on the value of L. And the reason for this is what's called, called penetration. So penetration is the ability of an electron to get close to the nucleus. Remember, that's sort of the ultimate goal here is for that electron to get close to the nucleus. And this is going to reduce the effect of shielding to some extent. All right, so we have two, con two, two effects, shielding and penetration. And this penetration effect is going to explain why the 2s orbital is lower in energy than the 2p. As my tablet comes back to life, I'll continue. Oh, no. Okay. All right, so we have, and then let's explain then why, why is a 2s orbital lower in energy than 2p by looking at the radial probability distributions. So we saw before that a 2s orbital has one radial node, and so it has sort of this shape here. All right, so this one blue is going to be our 2s. And then if we go to 2p, which I'll do in red, 2p does not have any radial nodes. So the probability distribution for 2p, it actually has a most probable radius that's a little bit closer to the nucleus but it doesn't have any radial nodes, it's going to look something like this. All right, so this red one is 2p. And so what, what this effect called penetration is, is that for the 2s orbital, for the 2s electrons, they have this region of probability that's closer to the nucleus. And that's what we mean by penetration, this radial probability distribution that gets close to the nucleus and so that's what causes the energy of the 2s electron to be less than the energy of the 2p. All right, because even though the most probable ra radius for the 2p is a little bit closer to the nucleus, the 2s has this additional small maximum here, very close to the nucleus. And so the 2s electron is a better penetrator than the 2p. And that's why the energy of the 2s is less than 2p. So if we're talking about a given shell and we're filling up the different subshells that are within there, because of these effects, shielding and penetration, we're always going to have the s subshell is going to be lower energy and filled first, then the p, then the d, and then the f. So for a given value of n, the subshells always occur in this relative ordering of energy. s is lower than p, which is lower than d, which is lower than f. Okay, so for multi-electron atoms, the energy depends on both the n and the l value, and the different l values are going to always come in this order. All right, another thing we need to talk about are what are called degenerate orbitals. So some orbitals are going to have exactly the same energy, which means that in reality there's no preference for which one we fill first. So the definition of a degenerate orbital is not an orbital that has disobeyed the law in some form. It's an orbital that has the same energy as another orbital. All right, so some orbitals have exactly the same energy. And the orbitals that are degenerate, and the ones that we should be familiar with, are the, those that occur in, in the same subshell. So any orbitals that have the same values of n and l are going to have the same energy in a multi-electron system. All right, a point I'm going to keep reminding you of because people often forget. For a one electron system, the energy only depends on n. For a multi-electron system, the energy depends on n and l, but only on those two quantum numbers. So if the orbital has the same first two quantum numbers, they're going to have the same energy. All right, so for example, in the 2p subshell, 
We have 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3 orbitals. And we remember we drew these earlier, px, py, and pz. So we have three 2p orbitals that just differ in the orientation in space, and they all have the same energy. So the energy of the orbital is not determined by its orientation in space. Which means in reality, if we're going to be adding electrons to these 2p orbitals, it doesn't matter where the first electron goes. These are all at the same energy level. And same if we had a 3D subshell, all five of those orbitals would be at the same energy level. So when you're in a given subshell, the orbitals that are within that subshell have the same energy. Okay? So they only differ in respect to their third quantum number and their orientation in space, and that third quantum number and the corresponding orientation have nothing to do with the energy of the orbital. All right, so then what we're, when, we're, when we start adding electrons to orbitals, as I've kind of been referring to this whole time, we're going to follow what's called the off-bow principle, which is the idea that we're going to populate the lowest energy orbitals first and then keep filling the lowest energy available orbital with each additional electron that we add to the atom. So off-bow principle is um, a German word that means building up. In this case, I don't think it's named after somebody. I think it's an actual German word. If there's any German speakers in the audience, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But the off-bow principle is the, what we call the building up principle. And it's that electrons are added one at a time And they're going to be added into the lowest energy sublevel available. All right, so as we're filling in electrons and multi electron atoms, we just have to keep adding electrons one at a time to the lowest available orbital, and that'll give us the lowest energy configuration for that for that atom. Okay, so the ground state configuration then is. Is, is what's going to result. It's the arrangement of electrons into sublevels, and it's the arrangement that has the lowest possible energy. And so we're going to not really have time to do it today, but next time we're going to see how to actually determine electron configurations. And the way we're going to do that, the notation we're going to use, that was not my clue that we're done, I'm just telling you that we're not going to get to all of this today. Um, each sublevel is going to be written as NL with some superscripted number, where X is the number of electrons that are in that sublevel. N is the first quantum number as is typically defined. And then L is going to be given as the letter form S, P, D, or F, not as a numerical form. Okay, so as we start working towards writing electron configurations for each subshell that's available, we're going to have, we're going to write the subshell and then we're going to determine how many electrons are in that subshell by filling the lowest energy subshell and then going to the next one and the next one. Now the obvious question is, well, what orders do the subshells come in? So we've kind of you know, alluded to the fact that it depends on the value of n. So n equals 1 is lower than n equals 2, and n equals 3, and n equals 4. And it also depends on the value of L, S, P, D, and then F. But we, also, we have a problem where we have some crossing of sublevels because as an example, the 4S subshell is lower in energy than the 3D because the subshell energy depends on S, sorry, depends on N and L, and in some cases they cross. So they don't always, it doesn't go where all the N equals 1 subshells are first, and then all the N equals 2, and then all the N equals 3. There's some crossing of the levels. And so we have to know what order these, these levels come in so that we can fill them with electrons. Now there's probably this um, diagonal chart that your book has. You may have learned it in high school chemistry where you arrange all the subshells and then draw diagonal lines, and that tells the order they come in. That's fine, but that's a lot to remember if you ask me, and you have to you know, align them just right to get that. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry, because the better way to do this is to use the periodic table to tell us the order of the subshells. 
And so that's what we're going to close with today before we actually start seeing some real examples of how to determine electron configurations. So for the periodic table, the value of n is given by the row in the periodic table. All right, so if we're in the first row of the periodic table, n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And so basically what we're doing when we're adding electrons into, into most electron atoms is we're going to go through the elements in order until we get to that atom. We're going to start here and go to here, and we're just going to walk through the progressive atomic numbers, adding electrons one at a time. And in each region of the periodic table refers to a specific subshell. And this is what gives the periodic table the characteristic shape that it has. All right, so these first two columns of the periodic table, I was attempted a bracket, which I failed miserably at. Let's do that again. Let's just do a square bracket. All right, that's going to be the NS subshell. All right, so I'll, I'll do that in blue. So these two columns, we're filling S subshells. So when you start with hydrogen, the first electron goes into the N equals 1 S orbital, 1 S. Now this one over here is kind of out of place. This is also 1 S. So it's going to be 1 S, 1 S, 2 S, 2 S, 3 S, 3 S for those first two columns. The P subshells are represented over here in the periodic table on the right side. So these are going to be the NP subshells. Okay? So then all of these columns here. Let's try this again. I don't know why this. Oh, one of these days I learn how to use this thing. All right, there we go. So all these rows that I'm highlighting in red are the NP part of the periodic table. So if we get to this part here, we're in the second row, so that's going to be 2P, 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 2P. So there's six total electrons that can go into the 2P subshell. Those are represented by this six elements. Down here, we're in the third row. This is the 3P part and 4P and so on. The middle part, which we call, which we'll um, define more in detail next time, this is the D part of the periodic table. So when we're, when we're progressing through these elements, we're filling the D subshells. But this we should be keep in mind is the this is the n minus one D. Okay. All right, so these rows here are the, the D subshells. So when we get to this element here, which is the first one in the D subshells, we're in the fourth row of the periodic table, so N equals 1, but this is the N minus 1 D, so this is going to be 3 D when we start here. And this shows us then that 4 S comes before 3 D, which is one thing that I mentioned earlier. All right, so that's the N minus 1 D. And then finally, the ones down here, which we're not going to use as much, um, these ones down here are going to be the 4F and the 5F. These little parts of the periodic table come from the 6th and the 7th row. These are the N minus 2F part. Sorry, N minus 2F. And then we'll shade those in with pink. So that's going to be the F part of the periodic table. So what we'll see how to do next time is we're going to go through and start doing electron configurations. And all we're going to do is we're going to walk through the periodic table with each of these subshell definitions in mind. And that's going to tell us which subshell gets filled next in the order. And we'll, we'll see a bunch of examples next time.